of St. Matthew, chapter number 1, verse number 21 through 23. There you will find my assignment for this morning. I will not be long because you know this story well. But I want to point to some significance out of this story and how we as Christians ought to approach this season. It is easy to be caught up in the currents of this world. The hustle and the bustle and the sleighs and Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, and going here and there trying to keep up with the Joneses and outgive each other's gifts and putting pressure on yourselves. But this did not start as the commercialization of that which is holy. The day we're standing in is a holy day. Whoo, I feel like preaching. Lord have mercy. I haven't even gotten to it. The one we're preaching about is so holy, they first started calling him the holy thing. This is a holy moment. And I will read only a few passages of scripture because that's all I need. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he, all by himself, for he shall save his people. He shall, future, save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold a virgin, a virgin. This is biologically impossible. A virgin shall be with child. No wonder Joseph wanted to put her away. Who would believe a girl saying I got pregnant by the Holy Ghost? But God, behold a virgin shall be with Cal and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. I want to talk just a few moments because we had such an amazing production. That was a sermon all by itself. But if you will indulge me for just a few moments, I would like to elaborate on the subject, the phenomenon that God would be born. Think about what a phenomenon that is. You're standing on the back side of it, looking at it, but for those who were in the Old Testament looking forward to it, the ideology that God would be born is a phenomenon. It is a phenomenon because God is a phenomenon. And if God is a phenomenon, he is going to do phenomenal things. Because you do what you are. Look at somebody and say, he is a phenomenon. And he's going to do phenomenal things. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us now. As we gather at the gate of the tabernacle to behold the descent of the Shekinah glory overshadowing our humanity. Hide us in your glory. Wrap us up in the folds of the fabric of your grace. Conduct your business because you are God. You never needed a crowd to be God. You were God from the beginning, and you'll be God when it's all over. Now speak, Lord, 
for thy servant hears. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. It is important in this time and all times before it that we understand who God is. If we don't understand who God is, then church becomes irrelevant. You get hurt, you leave. You don't get picked to lead a solo, you quit. You didn't make the deacon board, you're out. Because if you confuse God and church, then worship becomes cumbersome. God is God when church is over. God is God when the church doors are closed. God is God in the darkest season of your life. He is sovereign. He is Yahweh. He is mighty. He is eternal. He is everlasting. He is immutable. He is God. Nobody campaigned for him. Nobody had to vote for him. Nobody had to elect him. Nobody can dethrone him. Nobody can impeach him. God is God. He was not hired to be God. He just is God. Faith for us does not begin when we get a new suit or a new car or a new house. Faith begins with God. He that cometh to God must first believe that he is. Not in a building, not in a man, not in a choir. You must first believe that he is. Not that he was, not that he will be, that he is. He that cometh to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek not titles, not positions, no, 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 no. Those that diligently seek him. Look at your neighbor and say, why did you come? Are you trying to be discovered? Are you trying to be recognized? Are you trying to be promoted? Are you trying to be respected? Are you trying to get a platform? Are you trying to do a deal? What are you, why did you come? You must first believe that he is and he only rewards those that diligently seek. There ought to be a hot pursuit this morning seeking God. I bump into you only because I am in pursuit of God and my fellowship with you is predicated on us going in the same direction. And I seek God. Understanding who God is in his divine state is very important. But it is so difficult to articulate because there's nothing to compare him to. There's nothing to compare him to. Even those who represent him are not him. Those who teach about him are not him. Those who can expound him are not him. Those who represent him are not him. The buildings that are dedicated to him are not him. God is God. The Bible says that heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. That means that this planet that you call earth, that you think is so amazing, that has all of these different time zones, that means that this planet with all of the oceans and all of the seas and all of its continent all put together, that God sits in heaven and rests his feet on the planet you call the earth. The earth has a diameter of approximately 7,917,000 miles and it's just God's ottoman. 
You must understand however the, the, the earth is, is a sphere and God made it to rest his feet upon. Your God is so big that he's incomprehensible. He's so big that he's amazing. The earth is 7,926 miles, while the polar diameter of the earth is approximately almost 8,000 miles around, and God calls it his ottoman. Your God is high and lifted up. Your God is amazing. If you think the planet is amazing, I've been to the Grand Canyon, it was amazing. I've seen Niagara Falls, it was amazing. I've been in the desert since uh, South Africa, it was amazing. I've been in safaris outside of Johannesburg, it was amazing. I've been to Brazil and the rainforest, it was amazing. I've been all over the world. I've been down to Australia, it was amazing. I've been to Melbourne, I've been to Sydney, it was amazing. I've been to New Zealand. It was amazing. I've been to Ukraine. It was amazing. I've seen God move while I was in Germany. It was amazing. I've been into the deepest bush in the boom, in the darkest places of Africa. It was amazing. I've seen God do all kinds of amazing things in the earth. And God says all of it together is my footstool. 259 billion cubic miles I place my feet on. So when you're talking about God, you're talking about something that is indescribable. When you're talking about God who has no beginning or end, we are celebrating the birth of Christ but not the birth of God because from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Our God is the ancient of days. Our God is the prince of peace. Our God is the ever everlasting Father. Our God is without beginning or end of days. Our God has more healing in the stitches of his clothing than all of the hospitals on the planet. Our God can heal anything. Our God can move anything. Our God has all power in his hand. Our God is so awesome that he Look for someone greater than himself and finding no one greater than himself. He said, I swear by myself that blessings I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. Our God is so old that he is the ancient of days. He was before the first candle was lit, before the first star was placed in the heavens, before the first sun began to blaze in the galaxy God was there and before the first drop of water fell in the Niagara Falls God was there he is the ancient of days he is our bulwark he is our shield he is our bulwark he is our trumpet he's our peace he's our way maker he's our bridge over troubled water he's our bread of heaven he is our strength he is the breasted one and yet he is our heavenly father beyond gender descriptions God is God and he always will be God he's God in the middle of the ocean he's God in the middle of the sea he's God in the time of trouble and he's God for for you and me I'm talking about God when you stop worrying about flesh and start praising God demons tremble hell gets nervous Satan gets sick curses are broken yokes are destroyed if you ever get in your mind to praise God however you're feeling will fall off of you whatever is happening will fall over you whatever the devil said it will not stop you if you get your mind on God God is so amazing that when Isaiah came into the temple he said in the year King Uzziah died I saw also the Lord he was
was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Let me break this down for you. Every king had a train and the longer the train, the longer the kingdom. But God's kingdom was so big that his train filled the temple. Do you understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about God? Israel asked to see him, but when he started coming around the mountain, the ground began to shake and the mountain caught on fire and they said, no, 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 that's okay. We cancel our appointment. That's who you praising. That's who you're serving. That's who you came to worship. That's who you came to lift up. That's who you came to give tribute to. That's who you came to glorify. The one who walks on water. The one who speaks to winds and waves and they lay down prostrate in the floor. The one who has the last say. The one who has all power. The one who can heal all manner of disease. The one who can lift your head and keep it from falling. The one who can keep your feet in the time of trouble and make you able to stand. Touch three people and say, I serve God. That's who I serve. I serve God. I'm trying to help you, but I serve God. Hallelujah. I'm trying to help you, but I serve God. I serve God. He that hath began a good work in me shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ because I serve the Lord. I wish I had about 10 people that had a little bit of Holy Ghost in here. I know you're dressed up and you look cute and you're red, but if I had about 10 people that would get over looking Christmassy and start praising God, God would do something in this place. Since we're out here, we might as well have church. Somebody shout, God! You don't know, you just use the biggest word you know. I don't care if you know a word that has 15 letters in it. Those three letters are the biggest word you will ever speak. Somebody throw your hands up and shout, God! Hallelujah. It's big in the earth. It's big under the earth. It's big over the earth. It's big in the times of trouble. It's big in the times of blessing. Somebody say, God. When the doctor says you got to die, you ought to throw your hands up and say, God. When the bill collector says you got more bills than you got money, you ought to shout, God. When all hell is breaking loose in your life and the devil expects you to crumble, you ought to shout, God. Nobody can stop you from having God. Nobody can stop God from having you. Nobody can stop God from reaching you. Nobody can stop God from saving you. They can hate on you and they can't stop you. They can put you in jail and they can't stop you. They can put their foot on you and can't stop you. If God be for you. Excuse me while I praise him. I, I said, if God be. Preachers, take note. If God be for you. You have to understand the magnitude of what we are about. So you can understand the magnitude of the fight we're in. Hell hates us because God loves us. And I'm not speaking in code about me, I'm talking about you. The devil hates you 
because God loves you and he does everything he can to block you, depress you, defeat you, discourage you, intimidate you, make you doubt yourself, make you doubt your faith, make you doubt that you're enough, make you doubt that you can succeed, make you doubt that you can make it by yourself, make you think you need people you don't need. You don't need none of them. If God be for you, Jasmine wasn't going to preach this morning. I said, if I, if I had a guest preacher, I'd cancel him. I would call him up and cancel him because I know who God is. High five somebody and say, God got you. God's got your bills, God's got your house, God's got your marriage, God's got your mind, God's got your children, God's got your circumstance, God's got your situation, God's got your turmoil, God's got your pain, God's got your grief, God's got whatever the devil is trying to use against you, God's got you. How dare you look astonished if you believe in God, God has Got you. Shout God! <laughs> Sit down, I'm just talking to you. I just wanted to put the text in context that when they called his name Emmanuel, God with us. I wanted you to see how big that is for God to be God is with us. The personification of Jesus. Step one is to realize that all of this great big God would come into the world at all. That he would come into his ottoman. That's amazing. Truth is, he can't even fit inside of his ottoman. Truth is, he had to reduce himself down to his lowest common denominator. The Bible says it this way, he poured out of himself his glory and honor and humbled himself and got low enough to come into his furniture. And having come into his furniture, which was awesome, then he picks out a woman and comes inside of a woman. No, you can get it. The God who performed the delivery of the first woman. Put Adam to sleep so no man could get the credit for her. And said, this is not your fight, Adam. I got this covered. I'm, I'm going to show you what you got. And he reached in her, in him, and pulled her out of him. And heaven was amazed. But what I'm talking about is the God who created the woman now got in the woman he created, wrapped himself up in flesh and came walking out uh, in a flesh suit. And they called his name Emmanuel. God tabernacled with us. He, it, it is him answering the question, Adam, where art thou? The question never got answered till Jesus came. He said, I'm coming to get you. I'm gonna use this lamb as a temporary substitute. But lo, I come in the volume of the book to do thy will, O God. 
and he comes down to over 42 generations and wraps himself up in flesh and says, I'm coming to get you the incarnate God. Karna, 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 where we get the word carnal, where we get carn, where we get carnivorous, meat. God wrapped himself in a meat suit. <laughs> Incarnation means in meat. In M-E-A-T to M-E-E-T you. I came down on your level. I came where you could touch me. I came where you could see me. If I had shown myself in my original state, it would have been too much for you. It would have burned the eyeballs out of your head. So I hid myself in a meat suit just so we could have a conversation. Incarnated divinity. The creator has now become subject to what he created. He gave up his omnipotence, his omniscience, and his omnipresence. He submitted himself to prayer because he'd given up omnipotence, all powerful. Now he has to go to the garden and pray. Omniscience because he says, no man knoweth the day nor the hour which the son of man cometh. No, not the angels, nor the Son, but the Father which is in heaven. It means I don't know everything anymore. So I gave up my omniscience. He traveled because he gave up his omnipresence. Because as Father, he never had to travel. He's just there. But Jesus had to get on a boat and travel to come where you are and said, let us cross over to the other side. It is the humility of God. The God who said, I count it not robbery to be equal with God, but making of myself no reputation, he humbled himself and came over inside the woman he created to fulfill Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman would rise up and bruise the head of the serpent. Christ is the seed of the woman. A woman don't have no seed and a virgin don't have no sex. So the only way that she could be pregnant is to, I feel like preaching, I better quit. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be up here because I got time for it today, baby. I got time for it. Anybody got time for it today? I got time for it today. I got time for it. I got time for it. I know in whom I have believed. And he became incarnate with us. But that's, that's not the really good part. Let me give you the good part. <clears throat> the really good part is part two. The polar propensity of the nativity scene tells more than a story that the king of kings would not be born in a palace or a mansion or a cathedral or a house or a hotel. That the king of kings, the ancient of days, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the wonderful counselor, the bright and morning star, the lily of the valley, that he would come and choose to live homeless. Now even homeless people don't choose to be homeless. He chose to be homeless, not because he was broke, because his father was looking for a hotel room. You don't look for a hotel room if you're broke. But God had shut the door on every possible option 
so that he could choose a spot to be born that was the lowest of the lowest of the low. Not a house because houses were built for people, but a barn because a barn is built for animals. Because the man that is about to be born wants to be born in a barn because he's a lamb. No, 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 no. Let me show you. Let me show you the polarities of the text. You must understand that Jesus is the light of the world, but he was born at night. He was born at night, though he, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. He was born at night in a lowly place, so low that he could hear the cry of poor folks, broke folks, folks eating government cheese, folks that can't afford powdered milk, people eating out of trash can. Jesus says, I can be touched by the feeling of your infirmity because I understand what it is to not have a place to stay, a windy, drafty place. You're all too young to know about what I'm about to talk about, but I want to talk about the old houses our grandparents lived in where they had newspaper in the cracks to stop the wind from blowing in the house. Jesus was born in a barn so that even if he was a slave in a shack, you can call him and he'll hear you. Somebody holler, Jesus! And we are comfortable with understanding a broke Jesus, a poor Jesus, an empty Jesus. We love to talk about how lowly and poor and broke he was. But the, but the, the, the oxymoron of the text is that three wise men <laughs> bought him gold frankincense and myrrh. This is the offering that you give to a king. The, the, the king's ransom is brought to a barn by camel. Tell everybody, how many people need God to work on your credit? Touch everybody, got their hands up, tell them the camels are coming. The camels are coming, the camels are coming, the camels, the camels are coming, the camels are coming. I know it looks crazy. I know you're staying with your mama. I know you're living in a garage apartment, but God said the camels are coming. God said, what I got for you, I got for you. And you don't have to come to it. And you don't have to lower yourself for it. It'll come to you. I'll find you wherever you are. If I have to find you by night, if I have to follow the star, I'll find you in the shelter. I'll find you in your lonely place. I'll find you with your power off. I'll find you with nothing to eat for Christmas but a hot dog. But I got good news for, Jesus said, preach good news to the poor. I want the broke folk to know that the camels are coming to you. And if you receive it, praise him like you lost your mind. Praise him like you don't care who's looking at you. Praise him like you don't care what nobody thinks. Praise him like you don't care what you got on. I don't care if you borrowed something to come to church. Give him a crazy praise. Anybody look at your phone and tell him, my camels are coming. I don't care what you say. I don't care how you look. I don't care how you roll your eyes. My camels are coming. Now we got a gold rush in a barn. We got a baby laying in a trough. We got a child wrapped up in milk rags. That's what swaddling clothes are. The rags you use when you're milking a cow and the excess milk gets in the rag and the old rags with the old milk with the old stinking rags they used to, to wrap up Jesus. 
He was wrapped up in milk rags because he is the milk of the word. <laughs> Glory to God. The rags recognized the milk and the milk recognized the rags and it, it wasn't any dirtier than the flesh he came in. So if he was willing to step in the flesh, he was willing to come into sour milk rags and dwelt among us. You can't get so low that God can't find you. If you make your bed in hell, he is there. If you take the wings of the morning and ascend to the uttermost parts of the earth, God is still there. And still, he was God. Smelling like sour milk, he's still God. Listen to what Isaiah said. Unto us a son is born, and unto us a child, a child is given. So here we are. You, you know how big a baby is. We got a child. And the next verse says, the government shall be upon his shoulders. Look at how much weight the baby could carry. No wonder the Bible said, despise not the day. I'm preaching to somebody, I don't know who it is. If I'm preaching to you, make some noise. If you started out in a small place, make some noise. If you got more weight on you than it looks like you can carry, make some noise. If the devil's been measuring your shoulders but not your God, make some noise. The God you serve came with little shoulders but great grace and the government shall be upon his shoulders and of his kingdom there shall be no, I feel like preaching. I don't know what y'all came to do. I didn't come to bury nobody. I came to have some church. The government shall be upon his shoulders and of his kingdom there shall be no end. While shepherds were tending their sheep in the field, the lamb was born in a trough and dwelt amongst us. If you're rich, he can reach you. If you're dealing in gold, he got you. If you got frankincense and myrrh and stocks and bonds and annuities, he, look at the oxymoron of the text. Barn and gold. <laughs> Little shoulders, big government. Oh, I feel like praying for somebody who feels like your shoulders are too small for the weight you carry. I pray God strengthens you this morning because God can strengthen your little shoulders to stand a whole lot of weight. I want you to know, Samson didn't look like Hercules. If Samson looked like Hercules, they wouldn't have asked him, where does your strength lie? Come on, somebody. If he was built like Tubman, I don't have to ask him where his strength lies, but when you're built like Pee Wee Herman and you're throwing gates at people, I want to know what your secret is. Somebody in this room, you don't look like what you're able to do, but if they mess with you, they mess with the wrong Negro because there's something down in you, white folks too. There's something down in you, brown folks too. There's something down in you, Ukrainians too, that if you stand in God, God will make you stand out. I got something to tell you and I'm going to close. I want you to get this notes real quick. And I want you to take this with you. And this is what I want you to get out of the Christmas story. And don't let the mistletoe make you forget it. Never let your circumstances diminish who you are.
I'm going to say it again. Never let your circumstances diminish who you are. Don't let people diminish who you are. Don't let their reactions diminish who you are. When you know who you are, you can be in milk rags and still be mighty. You can have little shoulders and stand up to a lot of weight. This is what I want you to remember. You can be living in a barn and still be the king of kings and the lord of lords. Don't let your circumstances diminish who you are. You with me? Number two, true, true greatness doesn't have to be exalted. True greatness doesn't have to be exalted. It don't have to make a name for itself. It don't have to pass out business cards. It don't have to impress people. It don't have to ride around in a Rolls Royce. It doesn't need a fleet of people walking in behind it to be when you're truly great. I never worried about where folks set me in the church because I know who I am. Whether I'm in the front seat or the back seat, I still know who I am. Whether you drive or I drive, I still know who I am. Whether I'm riding on a truck or coming on a donkey, I know who I am. Hallelujah. Last thing I told my baby boy when I sent him to college, don't forget who you are. People will talk about what you do, but don't forget who you are. True greatness doesn't have to be exalted. It doesn't have to make a name for itself. It doesn't have to prove itself. It doesn't have to impress people. It doesn't have to showboat. It doesn't have to show off. It just is what it is. So I came around my house and they said, oh my God, what did you got on? I had on this little raggedy something. It looked, didn't match, didn't go together. Blue socks, green shoes, purple pants, orange t-shirt. Sometimes I break it down just as low as I can get it so I can just chill out. But even in looking like a spaceman from outer space, toss me a mic. I think I look pretty good this morning, but my anointing is not in my jacket. My anointing is in Okomo Shata. Himayata! I can give you my jacket, but I can't give you my anointing. The anointing that I have is God all by himself. They tried to make Jesus king, and he ran away. Because you can't make me what I already am. True greatness doesn't have to be exhausted. Number three, get this. This is so good. What God has for you, no, 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 will come to you. What God has for you, you don't see the baby seeking the wise men. You see the wise men seeking Jesus. The baby didn't travel, the blessing did. Slap somebody and tell them your blessing is on the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Been traveling and traveling and traveling trying to find you. Traveling trying to get you. If you study it out, Herod thought he should get the blessing. But when God has something for you, can't nobody who wants to get it. No imposter, no hater, no procrastinator, no antagonizer. What God has for you, I don't care if you're in the shelter, it will come to you. That's how you recognize it. God knows your address. God knows your name. God knows how to get it to you. Number four, darkness cannot comprehend light. The light of the world was born at night and the darkness comprehended it not. 
Jesus knew that he was the light of the world. And he didn't need natural light to have divine light. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You can be surrounded by witches. I wish I, wish I had an old time at church. I got a new time at church. I wish I had an old time at church that I had to go to work with witches. I wish I had some people that are working in some hellish situations. But you go in the office and you know who you are. Got a little bottle of oil in your pocketbook, plead the blood, claim your space, speak in tongues, you know who you are. I wish I had some old saints that when all hell broke loose, you dropped down on your knees and start pleading the blood and said, wait a minute, God gave me this house. The devil is a lie. You can't take my stuff. Darkness cannot comprehend light. And my all-time favorite, my all-time favorite, every catastrophe is an opportunity if you handle it right. Every catastrophe is an opportunity if you handle it right. Every catastrophe is an opportunity if you handle it right. You don't have to pray about the opportunity. The opportunity is in the catastrophe. The thing you have to pray about is how do I handle it? Show me how to handle it. Instead of falling out and fainting, I don't deserve this, I don't understand this, it don't make no sense, it's not fair. If God allowed it to come, it's an opportunity. You know why? Romans 8, 28, all things. Can I go a little bit deeper? I'm almost done. Jesus was born into a catastrophe. He was born on the hit list of Herod. He was born, he didn't do nothing. How could he have done something? He just got here. He was born on the hit list. Herod sought to kill him. Write this, Herod sought to kill him, but God protected him. Either you're going to believe God or you're not. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm not asking you to believe in our church. I'm not asking you to believe in nothing but God. If you believe in God, God will protect you. Not against people's opinions. People are going to think whatever they're going to think. Let them think. You can't spend your life trying to change people's mind. You got to know. Herod was after Jesus because Jesus was a threat. Jesus was a threat. They started bringing the gold that Herod would have got to Jesus. So Herod tried to kill him to protect his kingdom. It was a plot. And Jesus was born in it. Some of you were born in a mess. You didn't grow up on the right side of the tracks. Your family, when you look up dysfunctional, your family smiling out. Some of y'all landed a job without a degree. And you got a promotion and you going up while other people are going down and they hating on you and it ain't, and it ain't no need in trying to change their mind about it. If God decides to bring the camels over, he just brought the camels over. Somebody, somebody bear witness in here. 
Some of you got a degree, but it's not in the, even in the area that you're working in. But God put you in a whole different area and raised you up and blessed you. If, if I'm talking about you, holler at your boy right now. You got a degree in cupcakes. and you running a STEM program. Never forget who you are because of where you are. Because where you are will change quicker than who you are. Final point and I'll sit down. <laughs> The greatest things in my life, in the Bible, I could, I won't do it, but I could go all through the Bible. I might go a little bit. I wish I could take all y'all in the car to Montgomery, West Virginia. Your mouth would fall out all of your teeth, yours are the ones you bought. I was in, I, 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 you don't understand, it's not just that the church was small, wasn't nobody in it. I wasn't worried about the building. I just wanted some people to come in it. I was preaching in the building, wasn't nobody in there. Silas playing the organ. My microphone tied up to the amplifier. A drunk staggered into place. I laid hands on him and made him the first deacon in the name of Jesus, fill him with the Holy Ghost. Power! Ow! He fell out on the floor. Somewhere we found the note from the first revival and it said $2.50 pop sales. <laughs> $2.50. At that time, I think the pop was 50 cents. So we sold five. the greatest things. Lord, send them away. We don't have nothing to feed the people. That's a catastrophe. You mean we got 5,000 men, not to mention women and children, we have nothing to feed them? Service is over. Let's dismiss. And Jesus said, they need not depart. A lot of times we don't recognize our blessing because it's a small thing. Two fish, five loaves of bread. Jesus said, oh, that's enough. I work with small things. The widow said, I'm, I'm getting ready to bake a cake and die. Why? All I got is a handful of meal. He said, make a little cake for me first. Didn't you hear what she said? <laughs> now, I cook. If you got a handful of meal, and you're gonna make a little cake for somebody first, it's gonna be a cookie. <laughs> In other words, he asked her for a cracker. But out of the cracker, her meal barrel never run out. It never ran out, excuse me. Somebody say small things. Small. Little tiny things. I'm trying to help you locate what God is getting ready to bring in your life. You trying to find a finished mate.
You remember the first time, honey, I went to preach for Bishop Watkins with holes in my shoes? And I, I, I couldn't kneel down in the pulpit because I didn't want them to see that, oh, I can't do that. Ooh. I didn't want them to see the holes in my shoes, PT. So I crouched down, trying not to put my foot up so they wouldn't see the holes in the bottom of my shoes. In the 43 years we've been married, I have never had to wonder why you married me. Because, see, she didn't marry Bishop Jakes. She married Elder Jakes. She met Minister Jakes. She married Elder Jakes with the holes. How did they all told her, you a fool? Didn't they do it? They told you that I was one suit Jakes. Some of you have always been passed over because nobody could detect the value of your small thing. But God is going to do a great thing out of small things. I, 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 I had good rap, but wasn't nothing behind it. I was talking smack. I told you, stay with me, girl. I'm going to take you places you have never seen. <laughs> My brother, I didn't have bus fare. <laughs> but I told you, if you stay with me, I'm going to take you places you have never seen. I'm going to blow your mind, girl. I'm going to rock your world. I know I just lost my job and ran out of unemployment. And I know this gas is off right now and we're going to Miss Anna Roy's house to use her telephone, but don't pay that no attention. I know we picking apples to feed the kids right now. I know my sister driving over in her Toyota to split groceries with us so we can eat right now. You stick with me, girl. I'm gonna show you something. Small things. Now you have a term now called imposter syndrome, a psychological concept that suggests that you are not authentically you because you don't feel big enough, great enough, smart enough, bright enough. You say, how can my shoulders hold the government while my lips need milk? And because you don't respect small things, you stay trapped in places that are beneath you. And you feel buried right now. When you are never buried, you're just planted. Now I'm gonna close with this. I ain't come to convince you or nobody. 
because I know who I am. I didn't, that, that, that ain't what this is about. You can think whatever you want to think, I don't care. I came to do my job. I came to prophesy as I was commanded. I came to hear the master say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I came to stand up like a grown man who has a God who sees everything. I came to do my job. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. You know I'm gonna do it. We got the same mama. Some of the same people who doubt me are the very people I'm fighting for trying to get them houses, trying to fix their communities, trying to give them a chance. And I'm a small thing even now for against what I'm trying to do. And I understand what imposter syndrome feels like because my shoulders are not as big as my mission. But if God be for you, you see my woman standing here beside me? The one that you saw God touch her? last Sunday in this church. You saw her take off and start running across this church and I had not seen her stand on her feet before. You see her standing by me. Believe me for the works that I do. I never even touched her. I preached this gospel. What you don't know, she been running all over the house all week long. I said, will you please sit down somewhere? Don't push your luck. She all over the house, wrapping up gifts, all kind of stuff, baby gifts, grandma gifts, all kind of stuff, got church, got Christmas music playing in the house, running all over the house, bossing everybody around, getting on everybody nerd. She said, that's my job. I want to pray for everybody in this room and everybody online who has ever felt like the mission was bigger than you. I want to pray for everybody in this church and everybody online who thought, I got more on my shoulders than I can handle. I want to pray for everybody in this church or online who has dealt with catastrophes. Never mind me. You don't come to church to hear about me. I never preach about me. I never preach about folks. I never talk about people. In all the years I've been preaching, I never scandalized anybody, ever. In almost 50 years, nobody's name has ever been in my mouth. I preach Christ and him crucified. And I came this morning to tell you about Jesus who can take a nobody and raise him up if you just believe. And every now and then God take me through something that you can see. Because otherwise I wouldn't say nothing. I've been in all kind of battles. 
and walked out here and said, good morning, Potter's house. I prophesize, I'm commanded, I do my job. That's what a man does, you do your job. You do come hell or high water. You do what he told you to do. Thank you. Thank you. I try my best to keep the dignity my mother gave me the strength of my ancestors, the courage of my father. All of my ancestors stand up in me. You fight me, everything in me stands up. Yeah, you fight us too. We are one people, we stand together. And I wanna pray for people because I know what it is to feel like your shoulders are too small for the government you carry. Everybody bringing everything to you. Every problem, every crisis, every situation. And they're always talking about you so strong. And sometimes that ain't a compliment. But because you're so dependable, they don't think you got no feelings at all. They just drag you and drag you and drag you. And the baby Jesus' shoulders were so tiny. All these kids, I remember when they was born, the little bitty shoulders. You seen a baby? The government shall be upon his shoulder. And he didn't say unto us a man, he said, unto us a son is given and a child is born. When people put weight on you, they put weight on your little boy. They put weight on your little girl. And your little girl carries the weight of what your grown woman got to do. And I want to pray for you that your shoulders don't break because what I give out to others will come back to me. And if I'm talking to you this morning, don't you let your pride keep you in your seat. If you got a lot on your shoulders, come stand in this aisle. If you're watching online, and sometimes your shoulders feel so small for what people expect of you, I want you to see the magnitude of this story. <coughs> I want you to understand it. I want you to realize the very phenomenon that God would be born in us. I know we filthy rags, all of us. Ain't, ain't nothing to discover. You ain't got to investigate. I ain't nothing. You ain't either. Emmanuel, that God would be born with us, that he would leave angels to hang out with us hooligans. That he would leave streets paved with gold to meet us in alleys and gutters and trials and troubles and dysfunctions and agony. That is the gospel. The gospel is not how elite we are. It's how incomplete we are. And instead of getting on drugs, blowing your brains out, or getting drunk, if you got a lot on you, I'm asking you to care enough about you to come for prayer. This is self-care. It's not getting your nails done. It's not getting your hair done. 
is dealing with the catastrophes through which your opportunities are going to come and getting the wisdom. God, give me the wisdom what to do in this moment because sometimes the devil will use your temper against you. My mama would say it this way, he'll make you cut off your nose to spite your face. And you have to be still and know that God is God. And as long as I am the senior pastor of this church. Yep. Ah! As long as I stand on this desk as the bishop over this house, I know who I'm called to. And my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow. And I know if he's attacking me, he's attacking you. I know it, I know it. I know it ain't just me. I know it ain't, there ain't nothing that special about me that it just be me. Believe me, I know what it is to feel like your shoulders are too small for the stuff they throw at you. What drove me to this text is the phrase, the government shall be upon his shoulders. And I said, but God, he's just a baby. Unto us a son is born and unto us a child is given. And gray hair or not, people don't know that beneath all of that gray hair or them biceps and them triceps, there's a little boy in there. There's a little girl in every old woman in this church. There's a little girl that gets tired and want to quit. And you feel like your shoulders are too small for what they're throwing on you. And sometimes you have to hold your peace and let them drag you. You have to hold your peace while other people get promoted and you don't. You have to hold your peace while the story, you got a divorce, but they don't never tell your side of the story. And you got to hold your peace. They tell what you did, but they don't tell why you did it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Hold your hand up. My gift to you this morning is that I sit where you sit. And that I feel what you feel. And I don't want to be your hero. Not at the expense of giving up my humanity. Because I want to tell you, sometimes I get tired. Sometimes I want to call them up. And this ain't the first time, it ain't the first time, and it probably won't be the last. Because it goes along with the job. And you gotta suck it up and deal with it. Life ain't fair. The very people you try to help, the very people Y'all always talking about what the man did. It ain't the man I'm worried about. It's them people you trying to help. And you look at your shoulders and they so small for the size of the government that rests upon it. But my prayer for you today, whether you a grandmama having to raise your grandkids, or whether you're a woman 
he made the baby with you, but when it comes to raising them, he gone. Or whether you're a single father trying to take care of kids and braid a little girl's hair. I want to pray for you. Whether you are devalued on your job or unappreciated in your neighborhood, I want to pray for you who picked up fights that wasn't even your fight And you stood up for people and wished to God somebody would stand up for you. Am I talking to the right people? The amazing thing is that God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. You hear me? God is with us. God is. And he is phenomenal. That he would be born, not just in a manger, but born in us. Because I am the barn he chose to be born in. So we're going to be all right. You cannot troll, control what others do to you or say about you. But, but listen to this part real good. What you must control is what you say to yourself. And that's the hard part. Because if you don't say the right stuff to yourself, you'll quit. You'll dry up. You're with her. Remind yourself who you are. Forgive yourself for who you are not. You can't spend the rest of your life apologizing for stuff you can't change. And God will strengthen your shoulders, I believe, before you leave this room. You know what I was really worried about all week? Our terrorist threat is at its highest level. And I spent my week making sure that everything that we needed was in place in case it was an attack. The attack is supposed to be against synagogues and churches in the South. And I knew today would be a target. And we have all kinds of extra security precautions in place over your car, at the door, in the roof, in the back, all around us. Because while they were trying to kill me, I was trying to protect you. And we spent extra money and we hired other extra people. And there's all kinds of security in place right now that you can't even see. In case they choose us, it's my job to be ready. So a car bomb don't come up in here while we have in church. I have to think about that. And anybody who has that kind of government on their shoulders don't have time to be playing with freaks. I love you back. Yeah. 
That's young folks gossip anyway. Because they're not old enough to know that's ridiculous to be 66. That's a stupid rumor. <laughs> Maybe 36, but... I was a little bit flattered, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> bet you thought it yet possible <laughs> for Abraham to have that much. <laughs> Y'all say keep it real. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes you don't need a statement from me. What you need is common sense. Just, just common, just common sense. Just, just a little bit of common sense. But this is what's the star of the moment. It is not my storm. God will do with me whatever he will. And I told him, do with me whatever you will because everything I've done and everything I have and everything I've been able to accomplish has only been because of you. So do with me what you will. What I am trying to tell you about your life and your situation, don't let your little shoulders make you doubt yourself. Don't let your little shoulders make you think you can't do it. Even when it's unfair. Even when you're taking care of somebody else's child and your knees are hurting and your back is out. Even when it's unfair, when you had to take an extra job to make Christmas happen. Even when it's unfair and your shoulders are too small for the responsibilities you got. I'm going to pray that God strengthen you. I know you're praying for me. You've been praying for me all week because I could feel it. I told my wife, I said, I got the weirdest grace over me. It's like I'm in a, in a bubble. I didn't recognize the peace. It didn't even make sense. There were moments of pain, but th for the most part, the deepest peace. Partly because I know the truth. And partly because I never wanted to be famous. I did not build this to be popular. I wanted to be effective. I came in the building and I sat down and without talking to you or turning my head or looking at you, I could feel you worrying about me. And though the performance was amazing, it was hard for them to do it in an atmosphere almost like preaching in a funeral because you were worried. But I come to tell you I'm okay. I'm okay because I never told you I was perfect. I never put down nobody. I got my own flaws and my own faults, but I didn't do that. <laughs> that ain't the kind of stuff you forget. <laughs> Come here. I'll give you time.
this girl right here. Leather and lace. Classy and steel. Steady in a storm. This girl right here. We pray for you today. Lift your hands. We pray for you today. We touch and agree and pray for you today that your faith failed thee not. That God would strengthen you with all might when all hell breaks loose. That God would keep your feet from falling when the enemy uses your love against you. People who love hard, grieve hard. That God would strengthen you when people take you for granted and use you till they use you up. That God would speak to every inner voice down inside of you that says you're not enough and that you can't take anymore and that you can't do it. That God would counteract everything that the enemy has sent to sabotage you. And that God would fill you with all might and all glory and all power. And that God would stand up in you. Yes. Holy. That he would stand up in you. Yeah, yeah. When your feet are tired and your back is hurting, that God would stand up in you. That God would grant you wisdom and strength and might not to do the first thing that comes to your mind, but to wait on God to give you the plan of what to do and when to do and how to do it. Yes. Most of all, my prayer for you is that you would stop living in your head trying to convince people who will not be convinced that you are enough. Or he wouldn't have called you. He knew who he called when he called you. He knew what he grabbed when he grabbed you. He knew what he found when he found you. And I pray that you would be bold as a lion. I pray that you would be bold as a lion. I pray that the strength of God would stand up in you and that you would be wise as a serpent and that God would garnish your head with wisdom and know when your greatest strength is in your silence itself. I pray that you would know that in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. I pray that you would know, not just quote, that you would know that no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. I pray that you would know that Christmas is not about what's up under the tree. Christmas is about who hung on the tree. And even if there's not enough stuff under the tree, there's enough stuff that hung on the tree to make up for anything you couldn't put up under the tree. And I want you to forgive yourself for not being a magician. And I want you to forgive yourself for not being able to fix stuff that you didn't break. And not being able to change people that you didn't discard. I want you to believe in yourself enough to understand that it is not your job to fix people. It is your job to love people and stop feeling guilty about the people you couldn't fix and the people you apologize to and they still like funny. You can't help how they act. And I want your little shoulders, your little girl, your little boy to know you got grown folk stuff on you and sometimes several grown folk stuff on you. Your parents on you and your kids. I want you to know for this year for Christmas, you are enough. If God be in you, you are enough. You are enough because you are anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
you are enough because God loves you and he chose you and stop arguing with him about it. You are enough. Even when your spouse does not acknowledge you, you are enough. Even when they leave you for something lesser, you are enough. And you don't have to tell them. You have to tell you. What good is it to tell them if you don't tell you? He won't put more on you than what you can bear. May the strength of the Almighty God rest upon you. May the anointing of God rise up in your belly when the road gets tough. May the Spirit of God empower you with life and strength when you feel all by yourself and all alone. May God renew you like an eagle. May you present yourself like a lamb, but always have a lion in your belly. May you stand up against whatever is thrown at you knowing that he that has begun a good work in you shall perform it to the day of redemption. And may you walk out of here knowing that the phenomenon is in you. That it is not just a crisis born into the world. He is born into you. So I give you Jesus for Christmas. Everybody with your hands up now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the coming of the Lord Jesus. To the only wise God, our Father, be glory, dominion, and power, world without end, throughout all ages. In the name that is exalted above every name. In the name that is above all names, in earth, under the earth, and above the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I say to you, Merry Christmas. I say to you, amen.